Hi, I'm Stuart Molina, Music Director of the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra. Uh, today I'm here to talk about our final Masterworks performance of the 2021 season. This is a performance for small orchestra, strings uh, and woodwinds. Uh, one of our pieces is just for strings. The largest work just has uh, two oboes, two bassoons, and two French horns. Um, what I love about this program is it's music that, has, that hasn't really gotten a lot of playing, uh, certainly recently. I would say, in all likelihood, most of the orchestra had never played any of the music that we performed. Um, some of them perhaps maybe one or two of the four pieces. Um, but I love bringing new music, particularly when it's this beautiful. These four pieces, I think, are masterpieces uh, each and every one of them, uh, and I hope you'll enjoy watching this program. The first piece on our program is just for strings. Uh, it's by George Walker. It's called A Lyric for Strings. George Walker was a very important African-American composer of the 20th century. Uh, he actually died in the 21st century. Um, he was uh, a groundbreaker in many different ways. He was the first African-American to graduate from the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Uh, he was the first to receive a doctorate from the Eastman School of Music in Rochester. He was the first African-American to play as a soloist with the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, playing a Rachmaninoff piano concerto. Uh, and he was also the first African-American uh, to win the Pulitzer Prize for Music. Uh, the lyric for orchestra, for string orchestra, was originally intended as a slow movement of a string quartet, much like the Adagio for Strings by Samuel Barber. And in fact, one is struck immediately by the similarity uh, between these two pieces, the idea of a very slow, rather short piece of music uh, um, written in the key of F-sharp major of all keys, meaning that there are six sharps in the key signature, uh, a very strange key for strings. Um, this just shouldn't be surprising because Samuel Barber and George Walker knew each other uh, from the Curtis Institute. They studied there around the same time. Uh, and it's inconceivable that in the mid-1940s when Walker wrote this piece uh, that he was uh, unfamiliar with uh, Samuel Barber's Adagio, which is one of the most famous pieces of the time. Um, so this piece is intended as a memorial for the composer's grandmother. It was originally entitled Lament for String Orchestra. Uh, he changed the name to Lyric, uh, and I think it actually suits the piece very well. It's a extremely lyrical piece. Uh, he sets a very quiet tone right at the beginning, uh, but it doesn't just set the mood of the piece, it also sets up the harmonic framework of the main melody. Um, and that framework is an F-sharp major scale that ends as an F-sharp minor scale. So listen again. Uh, so at the very beginning, we're, we're given a descending F major figure. First, in the first violins, then the second violins join. Then the violas join. Then he puts it into F sharp minor, and now we get the setup for the harmon harmonic framework. An E natural, a D natural, before hitting F sharp major again. So again, D natural, E natural, and so then we get our main melody in the first violins, and it's traded among the various sections motivically. Uh, I'll try to give you an idea of how that sounds. so on and so forth. Um, starting very quietly, each successive time we hear this main theme, it's a little bit quicker, um, and it starts moving 
towards a, a final statement at the end purely in F sharp major, and it's almost like the clouds part and a ray of light shines through. All of the darkness is gone. It's just a warm lyrical melody. There is one piece of material that I would like to play for you that comes in between the main sections of the piece. Uh, and it's a section of music where it seems almost like time completely stands still uh, with just two chords that alternate almost out of time. almost as though he's saying, okay, we're done with that. Let's take a moment to breathe before we continue on. The last thing that I'll mention, uh, like the Barber Adagio, uh, this piece reaches an emotional peak um, a little bit past the midway point um, with a ringing chord, much like the ringing chord in the Barber Adagio. But I don't want to bring up these uh, comparisons with the Barber Adagio to make you think that this is a derivative piece. It actually is not at all. Um, it's very original, uh, very beautiful. Uh, I think it's a masterpiece in its own right, uh, and I hope you'll enjoy our performance of this. The second piece on our program is by British composer Malcolm Arnold. Uh, I personally feel that Malcolm Arnold is a composer that gets too little performance time. He's a glorious uh, composer of the 20th century, um, and his music is absolutely beautiful to listen to. Uh, it, he lived within a tonal world. He was unapologetic about this. Uh, he didn't buy into the idea that music had to be angular and, uh, and dissonant uh, to be good uh, in the 20th century. He was also well known for having written music for movies, and probably his best known score is the Oscar winning score for The Bridge on the River Kwai. Um, the piece that we're going to do uh, is called a Sinfonietta, uh, Sinfonietta number no. one. He wrote two Sinfoniettas. A sinfonietta basically is a small symphony. Um, this piece runs oh, under 15 minutes. It's in three movements. Um, it's lyrical, as is most of uh, Malcolm Arnold's music. Uh, the first movement um, is a little bit rhapsodic. It's a very lovely, simple theme that you hear at the very beginning. I'll play it for you. Field. And yet the way that the harmonies move and the way that uh, the melody is set, it definitely has a modern sound to it. Um, it's a short opener. Um, it has moments of, uh, of drama, but in general the feeling is one of uh, pastoral, uh, quiet, setting up the rest of this beautiful piece. The second movement uh, also is lyrical, and it has a main melody that we hear many times over. Um, it's a little bit dolorous, this theme. It starts out in the French horn. Uh, let me play it for you. almost has a movie music quality to it uh, and just an extremely beautiful song-like theme. What I find interesting about this theme is firstly that it's in seven bars. It's not usually when you have a, a familiar theme uh, it'll be a four bar theme or a six bar theme or maybe an eight bar theme. This one is seven bars and in the seventh bar he always modulates meaning that he changes the key. So in this particular case starts out in D minor
half step higher and you hear it in the oboe. And this goes on uh, several times over. There are other themes that uh, interplay with this theme, uh, but in general it's a very simple presentation of beautiful music uh, with enough twists to keep your interest focused uh, on this beautiful piece. The last movement um, is a dance movement. Um, it's in 6-8 time, so it has kind of the feeling of a country jig, perhaps. Um, and it's filled with syncopations, meaning uh, accents or uh, emphasis on offbeats. Let me play a little bit of the opening. This is a, a theme that we hear in unison at the very beginning. sound strange because you don't have a, a framework for it, but if you think about the, the pulse, and this theme will come back several times over in various combinations, sometimes with a kind of an accompaniment, just a, a, a motor that drives us through. And we also have moments where we have sweeping fast scales uh, in the strings that take us from one section to another. There's one more theme that comes about midway through the piece. Um, uh, you can call it a second theme for this movement. And uh, it's, it's a dance theme, but it doesn't have quite the same kind of syncopation as the earlier theme, just the same kind of energy. It's a lovely ending to this delightful piece. Um, I, it, was, it was kind of just a nice discovery. In these times of COVID, you look for pieces with particular orchestrations. And in this particular case, I was looking for pieces with oboes and horns with strings. Uh, and this piece popped up and I'm just so delighted that I found it and I think you're really going to enjoy it. The third piece on our program uh, is by a composer that I imagine many of you have never heard of, uh, Robert Fuchs. Robert Fuchs was a Viennese composer of the late uh, 19th century. Um, he was probably most importantly remembered as a teacher of other great composers. Um, he taught pretty much every great romantic composer of the, uh, of the uh, or post-romantic composer of the late 19th century. People like Gustav Mahler, like Jean Sibelius, like Zemlinsky, like Schrecker, uh, like Hugo Wolf. Uh, and I could go on and on. There are lists of composers that he influenced. Um, but he really stands wonderfully on his own as a romantic composer. Um, in his day, he didn't really look for performances all that much. He wrote a great deal of music, a lot of it um, for small orchestras, a lot of it for chamber music. Um, but he wasn't a composer that was constantly drumming up performances. And thus, his music wasn't performed all that much in his time. Uh, and it kind of fell by the wayside. But uh, there has been somewhat of a renaissance of his music, particularly of the five serenades that he wrote for strings and other instruments. Uh, this serenade, which is his fourth serenade, um, is orchestrated in a very unique way. I don't know too many other pieces that are written for strings and simply two French horns. But I think it gives him a, an incredible arsenal to write beautiful melodies and the interplay between the horns and the orchestra sometimes feels like a beautiful lyrical uh, French horn duet solo with the orchestra and sometimes it's just beautifully woven in playing secondary lines. Um, as I say, this is a romantic piece of music and uh, just to clarify things, romantic not in the sense of, oh, I love you romantic, but romantic, um, the idea of the romantic period was music that has deep emotion. Uh, that portrayed a story or told uh, something, uh, a, a deep truth about humanity. Um, right away uh, in this five movement work, um, we see that the, it is going to be somewhat of a wrenching experience. The opening melody has deep emotion to it. Uh, I'll play a little bit of it for you if I, uh, if I can. <laughs>
I mean, it has so many emotional peaks in the first 12 bars of this piece um, that you know you're in for somewhat of an emotional ride. Um, I love the way that things shift very quickly, not just in terms of the internal harmonies of a phrase, but the overall structural harmonies. He's changing keys constantly, starting here. In G minor, and soon we're going to be in E flat. And then we're going to be in D major. I mean, all of these things happen in the course of, you know, 25 seconds. Um, so this first movement uh, is an andante. It's flowing. It's lyrical. Um, actually, every movement of this piece is lyrical, but it really does set up a, a very lovely romantic world that he's living in. The second movement um, is a delightful, almost uh, dance-like, ballet-like uh, movement. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a perfect foil to the opening movement. Uh, as emotional and overwrought as the first movement is, the second movement is very simple, very joyful. I'll play just a little bit. Well, that was close. Not exactly right. But at any rate, um, and so uh, what he's done is he's given us two ends of this romantic world. One very lush, uh, one very light and puckish. The third movement um, is a minuet, or he calls it a minuet, but it's certainly not a minuet in a classical style, uh, but rather it's a stately dance in three. Um, here we're somewhat back to the, uh, to the mood of the first movement with swiftly moving harmonies. Here he does it chromatically, so the melody is very simple. harmonies move extremely quickly under that. Well, at any rate, so the idea is suddenly we're in this world where harmonies are shifting quickly again. Um, the, the feeling is a little bit more emotional. Um, and so despite the fact that it's a minuet, it's a very lush minuet. And in this movement, we really get the first inkling of the influence of Johannes Brahms on, uh, on Robert Fuchs. Um, it's interesting that Johannes Brahms, who was known in his time as a composer that didn't like any other composers, actually liked Robert Fuchs's music. And he spoke about it publicly, saying how he thought that Robert Fuchs wrote terrific music. Uh, this movement, I think, sounds um, more like Brahms than any of the rest of the movements, and the overall feeling of the piece is kind of out of the world of Brahms, with very structured uh, writing and beautiful lush harmonies uh, that fill out the music. Um, I'm not going to attempt uh, to play for you what I'm talking about, but when you're listening to this movement in particular, um, I think you're going to find the same, same as I, that it almost sounds like it's been lifted uh, out of one of Brahms's symphonies. Uh, the one that strikes me most is the second symphony. Uh, there is a trio, all minuets have trios, a B section that alternates with the A section. Uh, this one is a little bit more moody, a little bit more dark, uh, that has an ostinato triplet pattern that comes over the main melody. So the main melody is... movement uh, is an adagio, uh, a slow movement. Um, it's the longest movement in the serenade. Um, extremely beautiful, extremely uh, lyrical uh, as it goes on. It, it almost seems like it's one long luscious phrase that begins at the, uh, at the top and goes all the way into the end. It begins with uh, the French horns um, playing natural horn figures. When I say natural horn figures, in the mid 19th century, most of the horn playing was on a natural horn, a horn that can only play notes of the overtone series. So. And that's why you get things like when you hear
hear horn writing uh, of that period, it sounds because they're playing only the notes that they're able to play. Soon they added valves to the horn, and uh, as soon as they added valves, the horn could play any note. And so as you get into the music of Mahler uh, and the other late 19th century composers, uh, anything becomes possible in the horns. But at the beginning of this, uh, we, we very much have the sense of natural horn. And on top of this, we have a very beautiful violin line that emerges. out of the soundscape um, that we find in Brahms. Clearly Fuchs uh, knew the music of Brahms, was fond of it. Um, who influenced whom? I'm just going to guess that it was probably Brahms who was influencing Fuchs, but you never know. Um, at any rate, uh, this is a very lovely movement. Uh, and after uh, we hear the opening section and one alternating section, the opening section comes back in a variation. Um, so instead of just straightforward melodies, we now have a uh, movement around the melody, creating this, uh, this fantasy-like, rhapsody-like uh, feeling. And this um, is very typical of the Romantic period, the idea of a variation on, uh, on material. Uh, it, extremely, extremely beautiful music. And then the last movement is a stormy finale. Um, it, it's interesting because sometimes it feels like a joyful dance, almost like a Slavonic dance of, of Dvorak, perhaps. And other times it feels just like a, a, a stormy, uh, a disturbed, angst-ridden uh, piece of music. Um, I love the fact that it goes back and forth between these two worlds. Uh, it certainly ends in a very dramatic fashion. The piece is in G minor. And for most of this last movement, you don't always feel like necessarily it's going to have a big dramatic ending. It might just have a kind of a lovely major ending. But it ends very much in G minor in a very strong way. Um, this one features um, fast motion that almost is a perpetual mobile through the last movement. Uh, it starts in the violins. <laughs> so forth. Uh, and, and this goes on for a while, this interplay. Um, but then again, you have these alternating uh, segments that are just simple dances, kind of folky music um, that give this last movement a really wonderful contour. Uh, and I think it's a delightful way to finish this truly uh, wonderful serenade. The final piece on this program uh, is a symphony by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Uh, perhaps the greatest of the classical composers, although it's kind of hard to say that. Haydn was pretty extraordinary in his own right, and early Beethoven uh, is pretty wonderful too. Mozart, though, uh, there's a sense of this perfection sheen that is over all of his pieces. Uh, this is a piece that uh, was written um, in 1778, uh, and uh, this was a time of his life that was not particularly happy. His mother had just died. Um, he had been traveling looking for a position but had to come back to Salzburg. Um, and despite this, he wrote some incredibly delightful, joyful music. Uh, this, this piece, I think, was the second piece that he wrote after his return. Uh, he, this is the 33rd Symphony. The 35th Symphony came out shortly after the Hafner Symphony, uh, just kind of a, an expression of delight and joy. Um, so clearly in his writing, he was able to supersede what was going on uh, in his own head. Uh, the Symphony in B-flat Major, the 33rd Symphony, uh, is scored for just uh, three sets of woodwinds, so two French horns, two oboes, and two bassoons. Um, and here you're beginning to hear a fully developed Mozart uh, as a composer. It's not quite at the level of... Uh, 
of complication uh, and intricacy as the 39th, 40th, and 41st symphonies. Um, but the music is absolutely serene and wonderful. It perhaps a little bit simple in terms of its presentation. Um, it's not incredibly deep music, um, but it is perfect music uh, and absolutely delightful. The first movement is in 3-4, um, so it feels somewhat like a dance. Um, and you hear, um, well, I'll play a little bit for you. <laughs> The first movement is in a sonata form, uh, as is typical for the time. So we have a first theme, um, a contrasting second theme, a development section uh, that generally would play around with this music. But here, uh, he gives us new material in the development section. And this is already a little bit of a departure from the standard. Um, as I say, generally, the development section is supposed to use material that's been presented already. But there is one thing that I will point out. First of all, it starts with... Uh, Trills uh, uh, on an arpeggio. Now listen to this. Why do I point that out? That simple theme, uh, several symphonies later in the 41st symphony, his final symphony, the Jupiter symphony, he will take that theme and create one of the most masterful fugues in the entire repertoire out of that theme. And I think this is one of the first times that we hear this presented as a theme in and of itself. So he messes around with that material in the, uh, in the development section and then comes back to the main themes from the uh, exposition, from the first section of this uh, sonata form movement. The second movement uh, is an andante, again, typical of the time. Um, what's atypical about this particular andante is he gives us two themes, that's normal, you know, an opening theme and then a second theme, but when they return at the end, he plays the second theme first when it returns, and then he ends with the first theme. This is a little bit, again, of a departure. Um, it's part of what people call the Mannheim style of writing symphonies at the time, Mannheim being one of the great centers of music writing. Um, but... Uh, the main theme uh, features um, louds and softs. Uh, so it begins with a strong chord and then relaxes. And then you hear strong again, and then it relaxes. This is how it sounds. It's a very simple, beautiful theme, um, but these dynamic changes from fortes to pianos, louds to soft, again, give it interest. You, you, you're, you're constantly at the edge of your seat following this beautiful theme. Um, the second theme uh, is a, a typical, delightful uh, Mozartian theme. <laughs> like singing. And, and this is, again, typical of Mozart. Mozart, in his own heart, I believe, thought of himself primarily as an opera composer. And all of the music that he wrote for instruments uh, sounds somewhat like an imitation of the human voice, uh, certainly no more than in this particular place. As I said, after a short development section, um, he returns with the second theme uh, before coming back to the opening theme at the very end. The third movement, as is typical for the classical symphony, is a minuet and trio, an A-B-A -A, uh, piece of music. Um, this minuet was written after the fact. It was originally conceived as a three-movement symphony. Mozart added the minuet movement to make it a four-movement symphony. Perhaps it was suggested to him um, that it would be more marketable uh, if it had this form. 
At any rate, it's a lovely uh, minuet, uh, very much uh, in the classical style. There's nothing extraordinary about it, except again, that it's just beautiful music. Uh, the last movement, which he marks Allegro Assai, or Very Fast, um, features quick triplet motion, um, and again, alternating between strong, uh, loud, and soft. Oh, it's going to be kind of hard for me to play, because no, I'll give it a try. That's our main theme. Um, it gives it's a, a sense of excitement, a, a, a sense of energy, and this pretty much stays um, through the entire piece. It's not a, a, a motor that never ends. There are moments where you get a release from the triplet motion, um, but the general sense of this final movement is one of exuberance uh, and joy. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, doing these concerts for you this year. Uh, I hope upon hope that uh, this will be our final year of doing concerts without a live audience. Um, but I will say I'm very proud of what we've produced, uh, and it's been fun to do these pre-concert lectures. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me.